Okay, and here's Byron. Thank you. Um, when Kate and I were discussing this, it was kind of like, not a lot, excuse me, when Mo and I were discussing this, I'm seeing Kate in front of me, so that's the way I was thinking. Um, I thought, sure, I could do this, and then it was like, oh my, what next? Where am I going to go? And then it all kind of fell together, and then she gave me a deadline of today. It's like, okay, it's got to be done. So anyway, what you see here before you today is a 67-year-old white male who has been a member of a minority group his entire life. I have also been the victim of sexual and religious discrimination and bullying. Now let me explain, but first I want to start off with some of the joys of my life. The biggest one that I have is I am the father of a son and a daughter. They have blessed me with two granddaughters and three grandsons. One of them just happens to be a step-grandson, but he's still my grandson. He has blessed me with two great-granddaughters, the biggest joys of my life. Now to get back to a little bit about the rest of me. I was born a white male in 1954 on an Indian reservation in northern Minnesota. My parents there owned a small dairy farm. I am the fourth child out of a family of five, which has spread over 24 years. My oldest two siblings, a brother and a sister, were essentially gone from home before my memories ever started. They are 16 and 18 years older than me. I was the typical middle child, even though I am number four, with my younger sister being three years older and my little brother being six years younger. Someday I'll tell you all the story about him being a tumor. I was a very sickly child from almost birth, having severe eczema with a list of allergies a mile long. At puberty, the eczema disappeared and it became what back in those days was called hay fever. The list of allergies changed but continued on. Many of the things I was allergic to was associated with a farm. Well, the symptoms got better after I moved to town away from the farm, but they are still there. I also had rheumatic fever, and that left me with a heart murmur. The effect on me of all of this was when I was of the age to ride a bicycle, the doctor told me, you cannot ex do that much exertion. You cannot learn how to ride a bicycle. But you know, I was born and raised on a farm, and what's really interesting, it never got me out of my chores. I still had to do all of those and they were a lot more exertion than riding a bike. My education actually started in a one-room country school for the first and second grade. When I became a third grader, the school closed and I was sent to the big school with a classroom of about 30 kids. I only knew four of them. It was there that I first experienced bullying. The situation went something like this. I was up to bat during a game of softball. The bases were loaded, and the other team was ahead. I struck out, and we lost the game. I was teased mercilessly. Well, it was then that I learned it was more fun to go play with the girls. They didn't mind because I didn't know how to play softball. My father never taught me. And one of the teasing things was, you threw like a girl. Well, to be f a matter of fact, I was taught by a girl, my sister, how to throw. And you know, all of these years later, I still don't know what that term means, but I guess that's the way it was. I mentioned that my dad never played with us, but you know, we had a very good, what I described when I became a father, a very good working relationship. By that, I mean we were on a farm, we worked very well. We were both morning people, early to bed, early to rise, you know, that type of a situation. Well, we got a lot of work done, but we never really played together. It was the way it was. 
When I went to junior high, I really became a minority because I was a country kid that rode the bus for 45 minutes every morning and every afternoon getting to and from school. The country kids were stereotyped as being dumb. Well, I was a smart country kid that excelled at school. And in the ninth grade, I was placed in what is now known as AP English and AP Math. I was suddenly in the same classes as the town kids and many of the jocks, but I really didn't know any of them because I had gone to a different grade school. I had another situation growing up on the farm. I had two pairs of pants that I wore to school my junior and senior year. And interestingly enough, I remember them very clearly. One was blue and black, and one was brown and back, black, and they had a small herringbone pattern to them. I refused to wear blue jeans, which I had a few more pairs of, because that's what those dumb farm kids wore. Growing up on the farm was at times very lonely, especially during the summer. The reason was most of the kids I knew didn't live near me, so I never got to see them except during the school year. We only went to town once a week or less often during the summer, and it was for business with no time to play or hang out with the kids. A highlight of the trip was that we usually had lunch in a restaurant. And you know, I very clearly remember as about a six or seven year old, somewhere in that vicinity, that when I went to the bathroom with my dad, I was a big enough kid. I didn't have to pee in the stool anymore. I could pee in the urinal like my dad did, because it was one of those, for the guys who know, one of those trough situations on the wall. It wasn't a floor to ceiling variety. And like I said, that day I really felt like I was hot stuff. <laughs> Another thing, I was born left-handed. So during the vast majority of my education, I had to write on right-handed desks. And another weird thing about me is I don't grab the ink pen the way most left-handers do. I don't curl my hand down around like this. I curl it and straight. So what did I have to do? I turned the paper 90 degrees, and so I write like this instead of like this. Many of the teachers did not know how to react to that, including one teacher in nursing school who actually accused me of sleeping during class because, you know, I held my head up like this and I took notes. Well, she thought I was sleeping, but she says, you're sleeping and how's your hand moving all the time like that? So I clarified what was hand going on. Being left-handed also caused struggles when handing instruments to the physicians in the operating room because the tables were arranged right to left instead of left to right. Well, one good little note on that. There was another scrub person who was also left-handed, and it was always so nice to work with him because his tables were arranged the same way I wanted mine. And it was then that I came to realize, you know, us left-handers, we have to change. Why don't the right-handers ever have to change? <laughs> well, that's the way it was. I also struggled in surgery, I go back a few years, when I had to thread suture needles. Because, as bizarre as this sounds, I also have diplopia. I see two fingers out here. So which needle I had to hit was always a struggle. Yeah, you got used to it. You closed one eye. That took care of it. And it was during my junior year in high school that I decided I wanted to be a nurse. That was what my mother had wanted to be, and I'm sure that's one of the great influences in my life in that respect. But my mother's family was too poor to send her to nursing school when she graduated in 1933. I then went to the guidance counselor to see what classes I should take to prepare, prepare me for going to nursing school. His reply, you're a male. You need to go to med school and do pre-med. So I pursued this path, and after five quarters in college, literally, I was flunking out, so I quit. I'll never forget the day I came home and told my parents what was happening. The strongest memory of that day is my dad crying. My mother and I calmed him down by telling him I was just taking some time off to decide what I really wanted to do with my life, 
and I would return later. He knew I was too sick of a child to ever take over the farm, family farm. And I knew then that he really loved me and was there to support me. Yes, I also know I was blessed to grow up in a house where it was okay for a man to show his emotions. And as I said, my father and I had a very good working relationship. You know, I'm not at all upset about the way I grew up, and, it, and I present it only as a contributing factor to the way I turned out now all of these years later. I got my nursing license in 1977, and my first position was in a cardiac intensive care unit. I had about two years of experience, and I was falsely accused by a physician of killing his patient. This idea was actually supported by my boss and her boss. The surgeon thought he was God and was treated that way by many of the people in the facility. He was a classic bully all the way around. There were many times that my female counterparts were in the break room crying because of what he said and did. During the time I was working on this unit, many of my peers of equal qualifications worked as a charge nurse, but I was never given the opportunity. Why? I have no idea. And after this incident, incident I transferred to the neurosurgical intensive care, and in about two months, I was working as a charge nurse. All went well for about the next eight years, and my boss was leaving. Well, I flatly refused to work under the boss's replacement, so I also left. And I went to a facility, actually, that was competing across town. And about two years after getting there, I applied for a job as a day charge nurse in the intensive care where I was working. The entire staff thought the job was mine. Well, that is except for the boss. The job went to a person who had one-fourth the intensive care experience and not near the rapport with the surgeons that I had. But she was a member of the good old girls club. During this time, I received my bachelor's in nursing, and I left this establishment not too long after not getting the job to go to southern Minnesota to become the director of nursing in a 22-bed nursing facility. In this facility, I and the rest of the RNs did a little bit of everything, including working in the operating room. I left this facility three years later because it was closing. It did, in fact, close roughly 11 months after I left. I then went moved back to Fargo, North Dakota, and went to work in the OR. While there, I pursued and obtained my master's degree in rural health nursing administration. When I graduated, I only had a part-time job as a student and had needed a full-time job to support my family. So we moved to Washington State, where I took a position as a working manager of a three-room operating room suite. This was a great job, and I had a great boss. I was there for seven years, and then decided it was time to advance myself professionally, so I took a job as Director of Surgical Services in Idaho Falls, Idaho. For those of you who do not know, this was a very Mormon community, and I'm not saying anything negative about the Mormon community, but this is kind of the way it went. At that time, it was 80,000 people, and about 80% of them were actually Mormon. On the lighter side, I must share the standing joke. This is their joke. I have no problem repeating it. They said that I had five wives and 150 children. <laughs> that was the sum of the people that reported to me. While there, the OBGYNs and the orthopods decided to build a specialty hospital. Well, when it was finished, and they moved in. The OB director lost 50% of her business, 50% of her staff, and thousands of dollars of supplies. Well, I lost 10% of my business. Not a single staff member, but I lost my job. Well, 
There is one difference between the two of us. She was of the dominant religion of the community, and I was not. And as I was writing this, I thought more to myself, you know what? There was one other difference. She was a she. And while cleaning out my desk, I came across a letter that was postmarked, ironically, 35 days earlier. So I opened it. It was from a recruiter for a job at AORN in Denver. I decided that I would apply for it, even though I personally thought there was no chance that I would get it, especially after just losing my job. I was also very scared to move to Denver because I had been here on business and knew of the how strong the gay lifestyle was, and I was afraid that I would no longer be able to hide in the closet. I expressed my concerns to my ex-wife about moving to a big city, and she reassured me that it would be okay. Well, the concerns I expressed were the typical fears one has about moving from a small city to a huge city, not my real fears about not being able to stay in the closet. I did get the job, and so we moved here. And I'll get onto the coming outside a little more here in a few minutes. While working here in Denver, I was the victim of bullying three times in 16 years. I took two of these situations to HR, and they basically told me, you know, bullying is a pretty serious accusation. Let's think about this. That was the only thing that was ever done. Well, after getting no support, I decided, as many people do, just to put up with it. Well, you know what happened? The offenders all left one by one by one. And one of the situations as to how unique this whole thing was, was one of the parties named Debbie did not like men, period, point blank. And that, as I always said, was the first strike I had against me. The occurrence that I took to HR went something like this. My peers were having trouble with our boss, which, by the way, I was not having, so I don't know why they were. And there was a meeting scheduled in Debbie's temporary office, which was actually a storeroom, and there was a shelf that kind of split the room in half. Well, I was the last one to arrive in that situation. And when I arrived there, everybody was seated on the far side of the shelf. There was really no room. So I and the boss stood on the other side of the shelf. Well, it was a very heated meeting. And when it was over and done, Debbie told me to stay to talk to her. Well, let me put it this way, folks. She essentially reamed me a new asshole. And there's no other way to say it that I can think of because I was not being supportive of the rest of the staff because I didn't stand on the correct side of the bookshelf. Yeah. Well, the day she left, I celebrated. Believe you me. And the other situations, by the time I got around retiring, one of these people had been fired and the other one had also left. So overall, it was a good time at AORN. And my experiences growing up left me very naive to the ways of the world, including sexuality. And like I said, I'm not complaining about the way I grew up. I'm just kind of stating the way it was. Going back to my college career now here, during the five quarters I was in college, I lived in two dormitories with a guy named Doug. I really wanted to see him naked, but during this entire time together, I never did. I also have to admit that I like to hang around the bathrooms for very obvious reasons. But you know what? I had no idea what this meant. I had no concept what it was all about. During this time, I dated two girls, but these relationships were actually short-lived. Then I met Loretta, Doug, my roommates, girlfriend's sister. She would actually become my wife for 31 years through all of this. In between the collegiate terms, I lived the three summer months with a roommate named Anne. 
Here again was another situation where I really wanted to see him naked, but I never did. Again, I had no idea what this meant. During this time, I also met a friend named David D. He and I are now lifelong friends, 50 years later, and there's more to come on him. At the age of 20, after dropping out of college, I moved in with David S. Lots of Davids, I apologize for that part. He had lived down the hall from me during my first year of college. We lived in different dorms the second year, but we remained friends. I thought I knew him pretty well, but I really had lots to learn. We lived together in an apartment where the living room and the bedroom was one room, not really in efficiency, but sort of on that line. We each had our own single beds. This is the location where, as I put it, I lost my virginity twice. The first time was honestly to my roommate David, and the second time to my fiance Loretta. Well, my memory is very poor regarding exactly what happened, but one night David came to my bed and started to play with me. He was a bottom and knew what he wanted, which I gave him. Some may say I was raped, but I say it is hard to rape a willing, curious victim. That was my first homosexual encounter. I truly had no idea what happened or what was going on, but I did know I really liked it. And this actually continued on intermittently, very intermittently, for the next few months until I got married. After the marriage, David and I parted ways. He went to live in Minneapolis and I stayed in Fargo. And it was a few years later that I learned that he died of the effects of HIV AIDS. I always felt bad that I never got to see him again, but that is the way things work out sometimes. He really opened my brain, my eyes, but my brain just didn't seem to follow. It was about the same time that my cousin, a Navy nurse, was outed by her mother as being a lesbian. And what's interesting with this whole situation is I recall very firmly, very well, my father asking me, what do two women do anyway? <laughs> well, in my naivety, and I apologize, ladies, I said, well, there's things like fingers and tongues, I guess. And you know where I got my education? Penthouse and Hustler. So that's just about as much as I know on that subject. Now, back to David D. Three months after Loretta and I were married, he actually married my wife's first cousin. Two days after getting married, I started nursing school at a hospital-based diploma program. The class had 25 girls and seven guys. I was the only one that was married. I again was a minority that was a great challenge for the instructors because they were used to having all of these girls under the roof of the dormitory. We as guys were not allowed in the girls' rooms unless we were previously announced that we were coming. About three years after I was married, David D. came to town to see me, and we were in a restaurant, and he came on to me. I really have no memories of how it happened or exactly what happened. But again, I know it did happen. After this, we actually played with each other whenever we had a chance until I moved away. Then he came to visit a couple times and the story picked up right where it had left off. More to come. Since leaving home, I have lived in Moorhead, Minnesota, then across the river to Fargo, North Dakota, Mountain Lake, Minnesota, that was the small town with the 22-bed hospital, back to Fargo, then to Moses Lake, Washington, Idaho Falls, Idaho, and the final move to Denver in 2004. All of these moves were job-related, and most were for advances in my career. During most of this time, I actually had male-to-male -male sexual encounters in places like restrooms and shopping centers, in parks, at rest stops. I never thought of myself as being gay, because I think it was putting a label on it, 
and I was not that, but I'm not sure why. While working in Washington, I became friends with one of the guys in radiology. He was gay, living with his partner, and he invited me to go to Seattle Pride with them. I truly yet to this day have no idea. I never outed myself to him or anything. And I figured he must have had a really strong gaydar or something of that nature. Because it was at this experience at Pride in Seattle where I learned a lot. And on the, one of the questions he asked me is, what kind of bar do you want to go to? I don't know. What kind of bars are there? Well, he went on to explain you could go to a twink bar, you could go to a leather bar, you could go to a bear bar, all of these kinds of things. I don't have any idea what kind of bar we actually went to, except for it was three floors of guys. It's a huge bar up in Seattle, so maybe some of you might know who, what it is. And it was there that I truly believed that I realized I was gay. But I had no idea what I was going to do with the situation. I had two kids at home. I did not want them to live in a broken home. Admittedly, they were probably 10th grade and senior, somewhere in that vicinity, but they were still at home. Well, when we moved to Denver, very honestly, when we moved to Idaho Falls, the kids were both graduated from high school and stayed behind. My daughter was in North Dakota at the time. My son was in, um, stayed in Moses Lake. Well, now I'm in Denver, and it's about a year and a quarter later. I received a call from my hairdresser, who was also, quite frankly, a friend with benefits. My wife was within earshot, and I got very nervous, and she picked up on it. She confronted me, and I came clean. We then divorced. Well, at this point in time, both of our children were living in North Dakota. My son was about to be married, and I told the kids that I would explain everything to them when I went back to North Dakota to finalize things for my son's wedding, which was about two months later. Well, I took the two of them, no husbands, no wives, no girlfriends, no grandchildren, to the restaurant, and I said, I'm getting divorced because I'm gay. My daughter looked me square in the eye and said, yeah, Dad, we figured it out. <laughs> and things have been excellent ever since. I never came out to any of my siblings or actually any of my relatives by announcing that I was gay other than my own two children. But you know, I've had a lot of good experiences after that. When I was coming out, one of the first people I called was David D. He'd gotten divorced about eight years earlier and came out seven years earlier. During our conversation, he made the comment that he did not get divorced because he was gay. And I said, what? Look at all the years we have played together and all the time we played together and everything else. He goes, yeah, so we were just getting something at home. We were just getting something that wasn't being given at home, excuse me. And I said, hmm, that does make sense in a lot of ways. And uh, I've been asked why I didn't come out earlier. There are actually many reasons, but the primary reason is that my ex-wife had severe depression. And I was very scared that if I told her I wanted a divorce, she was going to commit suicide. I've talked to her about it. We're on very good relationship and everything else after it all. And she said, yeah, I thought about it, but it really wasn't worth it. And I thought, okay, that helps me a lot. I've always considered myself blessed when I look at people's reactions to my coming out. Now the story about coming out to my siblings. About a year after I came out, I was seeing this guy, Joe, and we were going to drive to Las Cruces, New Mexico to attend a funeral. I asked him if we could stop in Albuquerque at my niece's house so I could see her, then go on down to Las Cruces 
and then come up the other side of New Mexico and stop in Roswell and see my sister. He goes, sure, that's no problem. Well, we did that. And my sister called me and said, one bed or two? And I said, just one bed. Because this woman is 16 years older than I am, and she has only two beds in her house. I was not going to ask for both beds and make her sleep on the couch. That just wasn't going to go. Well, when I got to my niece's place, who, by the way, is a lesbian, she stated, thanks for coming out to mom. And by the way, she shared it with the rest of your siblings. <laughs> my little brother, bless his heart, said, told his wife, he's not gay. His wife looks at him square in the face and said, oh, yes, he is. <laughs> but my niece also went on to say that it had improved her relationship with her mother. It hadn't really been a bad relationship, but it had now just gotten better. And you know, at the time, I had no idea what I said or did. But then as I thought about it and her, my niece and I discussed it more, we figured out that's what it was, was the thing about the bed. My niece being, let's see, what is my niece, 10 years younger than I am, she goes, by the way, what in the world took you so long? Again, I had lots of reasons, but that's the way it was. I have, honestly, braggingly, the full support of my children, grandchildren, my siblings, their children, and even most of my ex-wife's family. And I wonder at times if it has nothing, something to do with the fact that in my family, I have the first cousin I mentioned who was with her wife for 50 plus years before they both passed away. Then there was me, my niece, a great niece, and at least three first and second cousins. The decision to come out actually occurred roughly 15 years ago, and it was one of the best decisions I have ever made. During this time, I have developed several meaningful friendships something I never had when I was trying to live as a straight man. I also met a very nice guy, and we have actually lived together as roommates for the last six years. But you know, being just a roommate is a problem. Even if after we bought two condos together and all of this good stuff, well, that all changed again, about two years ago, I keep running with this two years theme here, when a friend introduced me to a gay radiologist who is and was married to a woman, and they lived in Libby, Montana. My friend asked if I could serve kind of as a mentor to help him come out. Well, fast forward two years, a long distance relationship with a few catch up sessions in person, we actually fell in love. He moved in with me and my roommate October 14th last year. We are living life as dedicated partners as he is actually still married, but is working on his divorce. Once the divorce is final, who knows what the next chapter may bring. Now for a little bit of information about my singing career. I actually started singing in grade school. I can recall a Christmas concert we did, and our robe we wore was large white flour sack dish towels with a hole cut in the center and a big red bow. In the sixth grade, I sang a solo for a religious class. Back in those days, we had one hour every Wednesday morning where all the kids went to their respective churches and did church education. Well, I went where um, I sang a solo. It's the one and only solo I have ever sang. When I went to seventh grade, I started singing in the junior high choir. And I was really liked by the instructor because I was one of the few guys in the seventh grade that tr could truly sing bass. Well, fast forward 20 years this time. I was singing one Christmas Eve in church, and this lady sitting beside me said, 
you know you should be in the choir. Well, the funny part of it was this church did not have a choir. But that Easter, they formed a sextet, no, excuse me, octet. And um, I said, okay, I'll join that. And then that following summer, I actually moved back to Fargo, North Dakota. While in Fargo, I sang at the Olivet Lutheran Church Choir. It was a 75-member choir under the direction of Dr. Rene Clausen. Some of you may have heard of Rene. Anyway, one day he came to the choir and asked us if we wanted to go to New York City and sing in Carnegie Hall. Well, many of us said a fast yes. I was kind of like, oh, that would be a lot of fun, but it cost $1,200. I was a poor grad student at the time. Well, we had bake sales and rummage sales and all kinds of fun things like this to raise the money. I do want to say that the saying to get to go sing in Carnegie Hall takes practice, practice, practice. It's very true. Well, the big day arrived, and I cannot explain the feeling when I walked onto that stage. I do have to say it was a good thing that we knew our music because Mr. Rudder is a great composer, and we were singing under Rudder from England. But the man cannot conduct. <laughs> also, we were so packed on our stage, being the, a tall bass, I was in the back row. My music was here. We sang from the music of the person in the row in front of us. It was very challenging. Well, the other thing that was so special about that day it was it was my 39th birthday. And I'll never forget the choir singing happy birthday to me on the bus between the hall, hotel and Carnegie Hall. After that, I've been singing choirs most of the time, all of, most of them being church choirs, except for the few years that I sang with harmony. The other highlight was while singing with harmony, we sang in the Lincoln Center in New York City. Again, a fun, challenging time. Now I'm here singing with Sage. And as a member of these choirs, I've had great times and challenging times, including being a victim of bullying and made to feel like a social outcast without ever really knowing why. In contrast, performing made me feel I was contributing to the greater community and was delivering a great message. These later feelings have far outweighed the negative situations. My life has also included many years serving on boards. Yes, I used to be a glutton for punishment. <laughs> I served with AORN chapters, homeowners associations, church, and also Harmony. I've decided, though, after all of my experiences being on a board, I'm done. Don't ask. During my life, as I said, I've been the victim of bullying and harassment in school, the workplace, and on boards and in other social situations. I also want you to know that while being negative things, they helped create the real me who is positive, forgiving, and a person who looks at the world through a glass is half full lens, believing that dark clouds really do have silver linings. In closing, I have to say, life hands you many challenging situations, and what you do with them is your decision. I personally like to look at them as opportunities to learn and grow and win. I am not a competitive person, but in many of the situations I've described, I became determined not to let those who were against me get me down or to win. I also believe we are all the so the, we, excuse me, we are all the same, yet we are all different. We all have strengths, and we all have weaknesses. We are all right, and we are all wrong. Lastly, as I said before, how you handle the situations that life gives you is your decision, but I chose to learn from them and move forward. One more thing I do want to say, I do have to thank Bart Cox for telling me about Sage Singers, because without his information, I would have never known about what a great group we have here. So that's my story, 
thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions or comments, I'm here. <laughs>